Good afternoon. My name is Peter Vitala. I'm, I'm coming from University of Ljubljana. Yeah, I will not talk about programmable logic controller or PLCs, not because I'm not knowing it, but because I'm not so in, involved in it. So I, I, I proposed another, a little bit broader topic, which I call control architectures in manufacturing systems. And uh, yeah, within this, my presentation, uh, I will skip the introduction to, to gain some time. And, uh, but I think I, sh I should talk a little bit about the uh, manufacturing paradigm cha change because it's happening and it will influence all of us. So uh, I will go, go into this. Then I will show you some, uh, let's say, basic definitions and relations in uh, uh, control architectures in manufacturing. Uh, and I'll show you some models from the top-down approach. And uh, if there will be some time, I will show you one industrial case and one research experiment on these spaces. So why manufacturing deserves care? So th this is a rhetorical question. But you know, in Europe, perhaps we take manufacturing as granted. Uh, our industry, European industry, is, is well developed. But I spent in the last two years, half a year in South Africa. And I, I found out that manufacturing is even more important for the developing countries because it's creating jobs. It's creating value. I think this is important. That's why I would like to read this mission. Uh, manufacturing of products and goods in ge for general, industrial or personal use is becoming the most important activity in the world. Generation of quality of life for citizens and contribution to the continuous growth of wealth as well as power and position of a state depend decisively on superior, superior results of manufacturing activities individual, in individual countries. This value and jobs creating activity deserves strong and continuous endeavor of all actors of the modern society to ensure prosperity, better life and, and sustainable development. These conditions make research in manufacturing even more exciting and put research efforts and contributions in new perspective. So starting from this cognition, I will go into, I, I, I'll borrow some slides from my more famous colleagues. Uh, this one is from Professor Mitch Seng from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He's observing how manufacturing is creating wealth and, uh, wealth and how this is distributed. For the last 250 years, from the first to the last industrial revolution. And we see the growth of Western society in this period, the United States, but we see now the decline of these societies on account of uh, uh, developing countries, especially China. China is factory of the world in our days. So in Europe, we are considering this as a, a, in, an issue, as a problem. So why we would like to return a, a lot of manufacturing back to Europe to establish new jobs. Uh, my German colleagues from the, I think from the Engineering Academy in Germany, they are now somehow declaring the fourth industrial revolution is coming. The fourth industrial revolution Following the first one, we know from uh, um, origin, uh, uh, having origins on, in the vet, vat inventions of steam engine, and uh, starting with craft production and then with um, for, uh, Taylor and Ford inventions at, at the beginning of the previous century, and this mechanized or uh, automatic production or Detroit automation for producing cars, which reduced the price of a car tremendously at that time. Then uh, followed by the flexible automation, let's say, uh, induced by developing uh, uh, computer technologies and so on. And the fourth one is now coming uh, with, in, in, of course, driven also by the information and communication technology development. Uh, and. Uh, developed in the sense of so-called cyber-physical systems. So cyber-physical systems, we will learn a little bit more 
in, in, in next slides what, what does it mean. But this is somehow the fundament of the fourth industrial revolution. So looking ahead and seeing this new perspective for, for manufacturing, we have to look the why we need a paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift is uh, needed because a lot of industry is still working on the basis of old Taylorian principles of scientific management, which are very good for the beginning of industrialization, but have to be replaced. We also know that this philosophy of lean production <coughs> induced by, uh, de developed by Japanese uh, car manufacturers in the 70s influenced a lot also European and other industries. Everybody is now talking about lean, sustainable and so on. And we also uh, are witnessing a lot of developments of science and technologies in the last years. Uh, but I think I, I'm in the field about three decades, 30 years. And as I be, uh, look back, I think that the, uh, uh, the developments of information technologies brought a lot of new impulses for, for manufacturing. Beginning with NC technology, computer controlled machine tools, uh, two engineering tools like CAD, which are widely used today, to modern communication and so on. And in the, in the meantime, the world has changed. It became smaller, in a, in a sense, of course, it became global, a global village, we are saying. And uh, I think the, the, the humankind also recognized <coughs> that we have to be more careful about our resources the natural resources. We have to leave something for our next generations, for our grandchildren and so on. And on the other side, of course, we, we see, we witness that manufacturing is becoming more and more complex. And complexity in manufacturing is a very interesting issue we in my laboratory are facing very much in the last few years. Uh, I will skip this diagram. I, I, I will leave to the organizers my slide. Perhaps it's interesting to you and you will see what the next paradigm will bring to, to us. Where we are now, we are now in this mass customization, mass personalization, uh, let's say, paradigm and we, will, we are shifting toward open, complex, complex ad adaptive manufacturing systems. Look at the phenomena, what is happening, like crowd financing, <coughs> crowdsourcing, open design. These are very new things, but they are emerging and bringing new, let's say, push to, the manuf to manufacturing as well as to other businesses. Uh, I'll borrow some slides from my colleagues. This, is one, this one is from Professor Milberg. Professor Milberg was a TU Munich professor 20 years ago. Afterwards, he was the chairman of BMW. Now I think he's retired, but anyway, he somehow foresee this, this development from mechanization to, toward automation and FMS systems to functional integration and intelligent manufacturing systems toward autonomous manufacturing systems. Autonomy is becoming more and more important. The autonomy in the sense of autonomous decision maker, making, not top down, but from bottom up. Another diagram I borrowed by professor, from Professor Koren uh, showing the development of manufacturing systems from this mass production manufacturing systems from the fourth times toward uh, mass customization manufacturing system uh, based on a flexible manufacturing system toward uh, uh, reconfigurable manufacturing systems. And this direction is go going toward market of one, so single product production. These te technologies, uh, additive man uh, manufacturing technologies are very suitable for this kind of, of production. Another diagram I borrowed by Professor Spur, uh, very well known by my colleagues uh, from, from TU Berlin because he was once uh, the head of the institute. Uh, and uh, this is showing how strategical uh, features in manufacturing have evolved from competition, 
price and productivity up to now still you know still valid uh, it's uh, almost 20 years old slide towards singularity capability of innovation and learning so these are new features we have to introduce to our manufacturing systems uh, just to broaden a little bit the figure let me look at this diagram which I adopted from uh, one of the uh, quite well known this uh, consulting companies uh, looking uh, into development of certain fields and this is how uh, uh, computer technology developed from mainframe computers which were very expensive uh, only big companies introduced at that time in the 60s 70s then over personal computers which really you know came everywhere towards network applications and the internet which still is somehow the state of the art and the next generation we see in ubiquitous and cloud computing cloud computing we know we are using it not even know that, uh, no, that we are using it using Apple phone smartphone or Samsung you are using these services behind uh, okay uh, now the last slide to make the basis of my further presentation is um, how can we implement on what which basis can we implement control architectures in manufacturing of course we have uh, methods or uh, means for fi so-called fixed logic uh, control fixed control logic which, which is based on mechanical control logic or hydraulic or electromechanical control logic then we have the mid in, in the middle field we have the flexible logic which is based on PSCs as well uh, programmable logic controllers but uh, where I see more perspective are microprocessors based controllers and my students are mainly now working in this field not anymore in this PSCs are in, in, in industrial pulling courses no doubt a lot of industries running on this but you don't have so much flexibility and it's also more costly so my students are mainly working with this element from very low open source uh, con controllers to very complicated data uh, signal processing processors and so on then we have PC computers very suitable uh, for implementing in control and of course high performance com high performance computers APCs but that, that are not so much used for for, for con control purposes then on the distributed logic we have of course network computers and, and cloud computing okay so th this was somehow the introduction to to get you and myself into the into the topic now let us consider some basic terms and relations for control architectures in, in manufacturing uh, I borrowed this slide from Professor Windal also well-known German professor who somehow defined these levels in manufacturing uh, starting from a single work, workstation single machine single device uh, going up to integrating single machines into a production system or logistic system if several production systems are located in the same building he's, he's talking about production and logistic area then we have a, a, fa a factory one site let's say production facility with several of course lower level systems and on the top we have the, a production network a production network integrating several entities in, in, in a network form so um, that we, we start from that leveling um, then we can look how these levels are somehow interrelated and this is the diagram I adopted it's not the same as in this German book on mechatronic but it's a little bit adopted because uh, it's introducing a process level uh, then we have the control level and we have a monitoring level and we have a management level all levels are very important that we have to implement in our architectures 
uh, the management level can be, of course, on different levels as well. We have top, top managemental level, strategic, execu executive, and so on. But for good understanding, and I, I give this to my students, this figure always at the beginning, just to, to learn the basic terms and uh, the interrelations. Um, why this is not exactly the same figure uh, as from that German book? Because in that book here, it's not written process implementation device, but it's written Regelung, regulation, so a kind of feedback. But what is that feedback to the process? In a matter of fact, it's a machine. We say a process implementation device. But then somehow these, these arrows are not according to the rules of block diagrams. So I turn this diagram in a, a little bit different form, which is shown on this diagram. So I put in the middle the process, which is transforming input into output. If you look at the additive manufacturing, raw material put in this res reservoir into a finished part. That's the process. And this process is performed on a machine or process implementation device. So this machine is somehow in a feedback loop. And the machine is controlled by a controller, CNC, PLC, or what, whatever put controller. And we still have, of course, monitoring and management. And monitoring, of course, performing the, the, the function of observing and monitoring what's going on on this work system. And, of course, giving some correction action if necessary. And the same is the, the role of management. And this is now somehow almost online connected in nowadays. But where we have adaptive control, can we introduce the adaptive control in terms of, we said uh, before, the new generation of manufacturing <coughs> systems will be adaptive complex manufacturing systems. So where can, where, where can we introduce this adaptive controller. So we introduce this on this level because we control through the adaptive controller the process. We don't control the machine through that, but we implement the control actions through the controller and the machine. So we have to understand the difference between the control of machine and control of process. And I think this is shown on this figure. Okay. So this, this is the basic. Now we go into some details of, uh, oh, time is running very fast. Um, how we can model now our manufacturing systems. So we can start from very top down. This is the, the most top model. So we have one process, we have some, some inputs, some uh, supportive inputs, and one output, product. To run this process, we, we need Resources, we need information, we need energy, we need material. And what is driving the process is a motivation and knowledge and ideas, which result into a decision which uh, trigger the process. Observing manufacturing as a, pro uh, as a system started, this, this kind of observation uh, started in the 60s. And one of the most outstanding scientists in this field was Dr. Merchant, very well-known American uh, scientist. And he drew 50 years ago this diagram showing manufacturing as a system. Of course, of course it was starting point. There were other researchers also working on this, in this field, and I think it's always actual. And one of them was my predecessor, it was Professor Peklenik, who developed this model of a factory as a three-level system uh, during 20 years. I know his first sketches from 75 and the last one from, let's say, 90, 95. And it's, it's very good model for students to learn what kind of functionalities are needed in manufacturing. But not like a, you know, organogram, which is showing a, a tree structure. We have here a cybernetic structure, showing also the interrelations with, 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 with those elements. Uh, and the building block he developed at that time, he called the elementary work system. And what is interesting here, he introduced this feedback, you see, 
process and process implementation device. And he put a human subject into the system because the subject has a decisive role. If this is automatic work system, then he observes and controls. If it's a manual system, then he also performs some, some manual work. On this basis, we can develop, of course, all, all kinds of controllers for, for work systems. This is a, uh, an example of CNC controller for a CNC machine, all following that, that that logic, cybernetic logic. Afterwards, he added the uh, adaptive process control, as I showed you already before. So this is now really uh, a compact model of a work system, manufacturing work system, integrating the process, the process implementation device, the adaptive controller, and the subject. OK, but can we go now? below the level of uh, individual work system. Of course, we have to go. And this is now a mechatronic model of a me mechatronic, let's say, axis within a machine. A positioning device, a fit for, a, a fit, a fit fitting device or, or whatever. So this is also one level to observe if we are talking about the control architecture. Now, let us look uh, on, uh, on a higher level. So that was the lowest level, but what is on the higher level? We, we, we noticed from Windal that there is a network. So what is now the network? And how can we now introduce the, the existing models into a network, a manufacturing network? And here we found out that there is a gap. And we de developed some, some uh, new models, which we call call autonomous work systems and service units models, uh, which can be integrated in a network environment uh, for, uh, let's say, collaborative, collaborative ma manufacturing. And uh, yeah, to develop these um, autonomous work systems, we, uh, we added to element elementary work systems some functionality of management and, and control. And within this diagram, we establish three control loops I will show you in, in next. The one is the online control loop, which is collecting data from work systems and monitoring, showing it as what is happening. And uh, this is the feedback for planning and control. So that in planning and control, we can react as, as necessary if something is happening here uh, in real time. That is one control loop. The other one is, we say, the performance control loop. This is, more, this is not a, in, in real time, but it's in a, on, a, in a, on a longer time frame. Uh, we are evaluating a certain performance and then correcting if there, is, there are some misalignments with our goals. And the third control loop is then over the border of this unit within the network. So then we came to a condition that learning and knowledge is very important in this kind of, of manufacturing uh, system. And uh, we somehow dis discovered that be beside the, let's say, uh, sources of knowledge, which are from education and from research and development, we can make some feedback from the manufacturing process uh, itself. We call this learning by doing. So people working in the process, they are learning by, by doing. Uh, we, we can make uh, learning by research, by experimentation and research. But what is also now possible, we can introduce self-learning. Self-learning here meaning learning from data extracted in, in, in during monitoring and, and um, finding some patterns through data mining. So this is a new source of knowledge. So we introduced the learning, the learning uh, loop in, in, uh, in our system through knowledge elicitation based on data which are discovered or collected uh, during processes. 
we found this very, very important source. We publish uh, two papers now, quite interesting, on, on this um, self-learning. Uh, and I think it, it, it could be a, a, a good future for adapting, for, for evolving and adapting of manufacturing systems. Okay. So uh, I have prepared uh, two cases. One, one is an industrial case uh, in which we developed on this basis a, man a manufacturing execution system. What is a manufacturing ex execution system? It's a system which closes the gap somehow. Uh, and it, it, it turns this closed loop control, which is usual in manufacturing, into open loop. Uh, the open loop control into closed loop control. Uh, okay, I will skip this. This uh, I will skip this as well. I introduce here the the term of complexity, which is very important, and the co complexity source in manufacturing comes from different factors, and, but one of the main influencing factors is a human subject. Because he sometimes behaves un unrational. And this unrationality brings benefits, but also disadvantages, of course. Okay, uh, and uh, this complexity brings us in this point, uh, in this region of our diagram, which leads us to, let's say, unstable situation. So what we are trying to do is that we come out of this region into more manageable region through introducing periodicity or determinism. That's just the framework of, of this uh, observation. And um, we have different drivers of complexity and we can fight to some of these drivers, not to the outside but to the inside drivers by simplifying structures, by reducing the incompleteness of information. Uh, and we can do a lot in, in this field by collecting proper data through, through uh, uh, the processes. Uh, so we can um, deal with complexities by learning and enriching knowledge. Uh, of course, by first of all, by improving the understanding of uh, uh, complexity and by introducing some elements of complex systems such as self-organization, adaptation and ev evolution. This is an interesting statement which is perhaps very important nowadays because Taylor and Ford tried to simplify work operations but now we are trying to to go away from simple jobs in complex organization to complex jobs in simple organization. This is a kind of message and I think the world is going into this direction. Anyway, I will skip some slides uh, showing you this, this one, uh, showing you uh, the elements of support of control and management in manufacturing. From business intelligence to enterprise resource planning down to SCADA, supervisory control and data acquisition systems. And this is the gap we we try to fill with so-called manufacturing execution systems. This is the time scale. Uh, on this level we have low volume of information but or data, but these are span over a large time window. And here below we have a lot of data uh, which are happening in seconds or milliseconds. I will skip some slides here. So this uh, manufacturing execution system is supporting all the levels of ma management and control in manufacturing, but somehow filling the gap uh, between the enterprise resource planning on one side and control performed on controllers and SCADA systems on, on this level. So these are the tasks uh, we defined for, for this kind of uh, uh, manuf manufacturing execution systems. Uh, we started this work 10 years ago with an industrial company uh, producing uh, engineer-to-order products, mainly production uh, energy equipment. And uh, I think this development is very interesting. Uh, they are now capable of really controlling their, their, their processes. But not only that, also to they, they are capable of rolling out their solutions to other companies. 
selling this kind of, of, of uh, solutions. Uh, this is how we started uh, the architecture. Uh, we implemented it in, in this really heavy duty uh, machining uh, workshop. Uh, and uh, th this is how we implemented it uh, by collecting some, some data directly from controllers uh, and some data via sensors, collected by, via sensors, and some data collected over terminals in, in, in a workshop, uh, looking like that. Uh, very simple operation for, for a human operator. And uh, we are using this, I will not go into all these deta details, but just I would like to show you uh, how does it look. So uh, we can see what's happening in our workshop. This is the workshop with machines uh, indicated in green or red. Uh, red means in somehow in malfunction, in breakdown, or not producing. And green means producing. So if I would be the manager of this company, I would ask myself what the company is doing. Uh, but anyway, I, that's, that's not uh, the task which I would like to, to go into. That, that is one industrial case. The other experiment which I would like to show you is in, 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 in the, on the way to cyber physical element of an ubiquitous manufacturing system. Uh, this is perhaps more an, uh, a research issue which we are doing with our students. Uh, we implement these ideas on our small CNC machine tool I showed two days ago in uh, uh, Berzeit University. Uh, it's for us an open thing, so we can really go into the details of the controller and so on. Uh, I will skip all these characteristics uh, of the machine, but what would I, I like to show you? Yeah, uh, we are thinking about so-called ubiquitous manufacturing. Like uh, th this is a picture I took uh, two years ago in Istanbul on, on the streets, uh, where there were many of these kind of production units for baking uh, cast, caston, uh, yeah, uh, which, which is very interesting. And that, that's the idea of ubiquitous manufacturing. So we have a lot of workshops all around producing things, but they have to be somehow connected. And how we can connect and control them, that, that, was, the, that was the issue here. Um, and we, okay, we, we, we take the elements, which we already defined in the in this model, and these elements we have to put together if we are to do a process. So when we put these elements together, doing the process, we do it on the digital layer. So these are the elements on the physical level, then we connect them in the digital layer, on the digital layer, then we represent them on the virtual layer. And this is very interesting, this presentation because we present it in two ways. On the Google Maps, showing where a certain production unit is located, and uh, we, with a simulation screen where we can show what is going on on that unit, on that particular unit, all presented on the virtual layer. Uh, I will skip this uh, architecture. <coughs> it's showing uh, how we can connect several of these units together. And uh, this is the screen uh, showing the Google map, showing a particular work system running in Ljubljana, uh, and what is, the, what is running on this machine. And this is, that's not finished yet, but this is because the work piece and tool is missing, but the machine is running behind in a simulation layer. <coughs> so this was an experiment for the students, and they were very, very happy to work on this project because it's a, a little bit futuristic. Okay, so this was uh, shortly my, my <laughs> presentation. What I really wanted to, to give you a, mes a message is that manufacturing is really a perspective issue and gives us a lot of challenges to, to research on. And I wanted to, to show you how we approach in Ljubljana to these issues. Thank you very much. <laughs>